the quaint town of Mitsuk, nestled within the serene landscapes of Niigata Prefecture, a young girl named Fusako Sano lived a life filled with simple joys and innocent dreams. Born in 1980 into a family of modest means, Fusako was the light of her parents' lives, a beacon of hope and happiness in their ordinary world. Fusako's world was one of comforting routines and small pleasures. She attended the local school, where her days were filled with learning and laughter. A fervent fan of baseball, Fusako's eyes sparkled with excitement whenever she spoke of her favorite team, her voice bubbling with enthusiasm as she recounted their latest game. Her parents watched her grow with pride, marveling at her spirited nature and her kind heart. Fusako was not just a child of their family. She was a cherished member of the small community, her presence like a warm breeze on a spring day. On November 13, 1990, just two weeks shy of her 10th birthday, Fusako's life took a fateful turn. She lingered at school that day, her heart racing with the thrill of the baseball game she had just witnessed. As she made her way home, the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across her path. The streets were unusually empty, the chill of the autumn evening driving most indoors. Fusako wrapped her coat tighter around her, her breath forming small clouds in the cold air. She walked with a spring in her step, her mind replaying the best moments of the game, oblivious to the sinister shadow that was about to fall over her world. As she walked, a car approached, its headlights cutting through the twilight. It sped past her, then abruptly swerved and stopped, blocking her path. The screech of brakes shattered the quiet, and in that moment, Fusako's world changed forever. The driver emerged, a figure shrouded in darkness, his intentions as obscure as the night that was rapidly descending. Fusako's heart pounded in her chest, a sense of dread enveloping her as the figure approached. In that cold, desolate street, under the watchful eyes of the stars, Fusako Sano stood on the precipice of an abyss, her childhood innocence about to be swallowed by a darkness beyond comprehension. The tale of Fusako Sano, a narrative woven with tragedy and resilience, had just begun. In the shadowy corners of Niigata Prefecture, a troubled soul wandered, lost in the complexities of his own mind. Nobuyuki Sato, born in 1962 into a life of privilege and wealth, was a stark contrast to the innocent Fusako Sano, the youngest child in a blended family. Nobuyuki grew up in the lap of luxury, his every whim catered to by doting parents. But beneath the veneer of opulence, there lurked a storm of emotional turmoil. Nobuyuki's childhood was marked by capricious demands and uncontrolled tantrums, his emotions a turbulent sea that no one could navigate. His father, a successful businessman, built a grand European-style house, a testament to the family's affluence. But for Nobuyuki, this house became a gilded cage, its luxurious walls echoing with his cries of frustration and fear. Despite his tall, striking stature, Nobuyuki slouched, burdened by insecurities and a plethora of phobias. Nyctophobia, the fear of darkness, haunted his nights, while misophobia, the dread of germs, shadowed his days. A conflicting combination of autophobia and sociophobia left him in a perpetual state of loneliness and discomfort, afraid of both solitude and social interaction. Nobuyuki's school life mirrored his troubled psych. His strange behaviors and unpredictable moods alienated his peers, turning him into an outcast. His aggressiveness, especially towards his mother, revealed the darker shades of his character. The boy who had everything was, in truth, a prisoner of his own mind. As Nobuyuki transitioned into adulthood, his problems deepened. He drifted from job to job, his erratic behavior and conflicts with colleagues leaving a trail of broken opportunities. His parents, ever forgiving, continued to shield him from the consequences of his actions, their love blinding them to the growing danger. The Sato family home, once a symbol of prosperity, became a fortress of seclusion for Nobuyuki. He retreated to his room, shutting out the world and his own family. The luxurious second floor of the house became his domain, 
a kingdom where he ruled alone, his mind teetering on the brink of an unfathomable abyss. Nobuyuki's life was a paradox, a blend of privilege and pain, his inner demons driving him further into isolation. In this solitude, his thoughts twisted and turned, taking a dark and foreboding path. Unbeknownst to the world, within the walls of the Sado residence, a storm was brewing, one that would soon engulf an innocent life in its destructive wake. In the spring of 1989, the year before Fusako Sano's life would intersect with darkness, Nobuyuki Sato's troubled soul manifested into a chilling prelude. The streets of Niigata, usually bustling with the innocent laughter of schoolchildren, became the stage for Nobuyuki's first sinister act. Nobuyuki, now a brooding adult, haunted by phobias and marred by social isolation, found a twisted solace in observing the local school. His presence, a dark specter lurking in the peripheries, went unnoticed by the joyful, unsuspecting children. But beneath this veneer of passivity, a dangerous impulse was brewing. One fateful day, as the school bell echoed its daily chorus, signifying the end of lessons, Nobuyuki's repressed urges surged to the forefront. A young girl, barely nine years old, became the unwitting target of his dark fascination. In a brazen act that shattered the tranquility of the school grounds, Nobuyuki lunged, his actions swift and alarming. He seized the young girl with a startling ferocity, lifting her as if she weighed nothing, his intent as clear as it was terrifying. But fate intervened in the form of quick-acting bystanders and a vigilant school security guard. They rushed to the girl's aid, their collective efforts thwarting Nobuyuki's appalling attempt. The police arrived swiftly, the sirens cutting through the air, a stark contrast to the school's usual atmosphere of calm learning. Nobuyuki was detained, his first foray into kidnapping abruptly halted. The community reeled in shock, such acts of violence were alien to their peaceful existence. The trial that ensued should have been a turning point, a moment to alter Nobuyuki's dark trajectory. But instead, it became a missed opportunity, a foreshadowing of the greater tragedy to come. Due to his father's influence and financial power, Nobuyuki received a mere slap on the wrist. A year's probation, a punishment that paled in comparison to the gravity of his crime. Even more disturbingly, Nobuyuki's father used his connections to expunge his son's criminal record, erasing this sinister act from official memory. The community, still shaken, gradually returned to its normal rhythm. Unaware that the shadow of Nobuyuki Sato still loomed large. In this missed opportunity for justice, a dangerous precedent was set. The seeds of a greater evil were sown, nurtured by neglect and oversight. Nobuyuki, unchastened and undeterred, retreated back into his world, his dark impulses simmering beneath the surface, waiting for the moment to rise again. The day of November 13, 1990, dawned like any other in the small town of Mitsuk, but for Fusako Sano, it marked the end of her childhood innocence. The sun set early as autumn deepened, casting long shadows that blended with the growing chill of the evening. Fusako, still basking in the joy of the school baseball game, was unaware of the malevolent fate that awaited her. As she made her way home, a lone car prowled the streets, driven by a man whose heart was clouded with sinister intentions. Nobuyuki Sato, emboldened by his previous escape from justice and driven by his dark impulses, was on the hunt. His eyes, cold and calculating, fixed upon Fusako as she walked, her youthful exuberance shining like a beacon in the dimming light. In a swift, terrifying moment, Nobuyuki executed his plan. The car screeched to a halt beside Fusako the abruptness of the action shattering the tranquility of the evening. Before Fusako could react, Nobuyuki was upon her, his knife glinting ominously in the twilight. Fusako's world turned into a blur of fear and confusion. Her screams were muffled as Nobuyuki forced her into the trunk of his car, binding her hands and feet with ruthless efficiency. The innocence of her youth was cruelly snatched away as she lay confined in the dark, cramped space, 
Every bump and turn of the car a reminder of her perilous situation. Nobuyuki drove with a chilling calmness, his mind focused on the heinous act he was committing. Arriving at his house, he carried the terrified Fuzako to his room, ensuring no one saw them. His house, once a symbol of wealth and status, had now become a prison, its walls concealing a nightmare that was just beginning. Inside his room, Nobuyuki revealed the full extent of his depravity. He tied Fuzako to the bed, his threats of violence ensuring her compliance. The room, once a child's haven, transformed into a cell, the toys and comforts now grotesque witnesses to an unspeakable crime. For Fusako Sano, the world outside ceased to exist. The room, with its curtained windows and locked door, became her entire universe. A universe governed by fear and despair. Her captor, a man whose mind was a labyrinth of madness, held her life in his hands. As the night enveloped the town of Mitsuk, a family's heartache began. Unaware of the tragedy that had befallen them, Fusako's parents waited for a daughter who would not return. The stars that night shone down on a world irrevocably altered, the course of several lives changed by a single sinister act of abduction. As night deepened in Mitsuk, a sense of unease took root in the Sano household. Fusako, usually punctual and responsible, had not returned from school. Her parents, initially calm, expecting her delayed by the excitement of the baseball game, soon felt the gnawing pangs of worry. The passing hours, silent and still, heightened their anxiety. With heavy hearts and minds clouded with fear, they embarked on a desperate search. Tracing Fusako's usual route from school to home, they called her name into the dark, empty streets, each unanswered call intensifying their dread. The cold autumn air seemed to echo their growing despair. Realizing the gravity of the situation, they turned to the police, clinging to hope that their beloved daughter would be swiftly found. The police spurred into action, mobilized a search operation. The town of Mitsuk, usually so serene, buzzed with the urgency of the search, its residents shaken by the rarity of such an event in their close-knit community. The following day, the search intensified. Over 200 people, neighbors, friends, even strangers touched by the family's plight, joined in. They calmed the area, distributing flyers with Fusako's photograph, her wide, innocent eyes staring out at a community united in a singular purpose. Despite these efforts, the days passed with no sign of Fusako. The initial surge of activity and hope gradually gave way to a disheartening silence. Theories and rumors swirled some outlandish, some plausible, but all without substance. The investigation explored every lead, every possible clue, but Fuzako seemed to have vanished into thin air. Nobuyuki Sato, living in unsettling proximity to Fuzako's school and the police station, remained unnoticed. His past transgressions, obscured by his father's influence, kept him from the list of potential suspects. The very system meant to protect the innocent had unwittingly shielded a predator. The massive search continued for months, its scale a testament to the community's commitment to finding Fusako. Buildings were searched, suspicious vehicles inspected, and vast stretches of land scoured. Yet the mystery of Fusako's disappearance remained unsolved. Amidst this exhaustive search, a cruel irony persisted. Fusako, hidden in plain sight within the walls of the Sedo residence, remained beyond reach. Her world had shrunk to the confines of a room, her voice silenced by fear and, and captivity. As the seasons changed and years passed, the fervor of the search dimmed, leaving behind a haunting question. Where was Fusako Sano? While Fusako languished in captivity, another tragedy unfolded unnoticed in the Sedo household. Nobuyuki's mother, an elderly woman burdened with years of suffering under her son's tyranny, lived a life of silent torment. She, too, was a prisoner, albeit in a different sense, trapped by fear and a mother's misplaced love for her wayward son. As years passed, Nobuyuki's behavior grew increasingly erratic and violent. The once grand house, a symbol of the family's affluence, 
now echoed with the sounds of conflict and despair. His mother bore the brunt of his unpredictable moods, her days marked by abuse and intimidation. In 1996, driven to the edge of endurance, she sought refuge in retirement. But leaving the workforce only exacerbated her plight, binding her closer to the son who had become her tormentor. Her life, once filled with the responsibilities of work and motherhood, now revolved around appeasing Nobuyuki's whims and enduring his abuse. Her pleas for help, desperate attempts to escape her living nightmare, fell on deaf ears. She turned to the police, a cry for help from a woman on the brink. But her plight was dismissed, her fears minimized. The police, perhaps unwilling to delve into the complexities of domestic strife, persuaded her to retract her statement. She sought help from the public health center, hoping for a solution, a way to save both herself and her son from the dark path he had taken. But again, her concerns were brushed aside, her fears deemed insufficient to warrant intervention. This systemic failure, a tragic blend of indifference and bureaucracy, left her stranded, her cries for help lost in a maze of procedures and skepticism. The very institutions designed to protect and serve turned their backs, leaving her to fend for herself in a household that had become a den of madness. The irony was stark. Two women, a mother and a young girl, trapped in the same house, yet worlds apart. One, a prisoner of a room, her voice silenced by fear. The other, a prisoner of circumstance, her pleas for help unheeded. Both victims of the same man, their suffering a silent testament to the failures of those who should have protected them. January 2000 marked the turning point in the harrowing saga of Fusako Sano, a moment when the veil of horror that shrouded the Sado residence was finally lifted. The catalyst for this revelation was not a calculated police operation or a lucky break in the investigation, but a desperate call for help from Nobuyuki's beleaguered mother. After enduring years of abuse, the elderly woman reached her breaking point. In a moment of sheer desperation, she called for medical assistance, her voice trembling with fear and pain. She reported not only the physical assault by her son, but also revealed, perhaps unwittingly, the presence of another victim within the walls of her home. The authorities, finally responding to the gravity of her distress, arrived at the Seto residence. They found Nobuyuki visibly agitated, his behavior erratic and confrontational. Forced to subdue him, the police handcuffed him, a measure that seemed to exacerbate his volatile state. As they explored the house, the officers stumbled upon a chilling discovery. In Nobuyuki's room, amidst the clutter and shadows, lay a pile of blankets on the bed. It was an unremarkable sight, except for the slight, almost imperceptible movement beneath the fabric. Pulling back the layers, the officers uncovered a frail, emaciated figure. A young woman, her eyes wide with a mixture of fear and disbelief. It was Fusako Sano, her name almost forgotten in the long years of her disappearance. The sight of her, pale and weak, barely recognizable from the photographs that had been circulated in the search for her, struck the officers with a profound sense of horror and disbelief. When questioned, Fusako's voice was barely a whisper, her words a mix of relief and fear. She confirmed her identity and recounted, in fragmented sentences, the nightmare of her captivity. The revelation sent shockwaves through the officers, a mix of anger, sadness, and guilt washing over them. Nobuyuki's mother, brought to the room, expressed genuine shock and disbelief at the sight of Fusako. She claimed ignorance of the young girl's presence in her home, a statement that, while difficult to believe, highlighted the extent of Nobuyuki's control and deception. This moment marked the end of Yusako's long ordeal, a period of her life lost to the darkness of captivity. But it also marked the beginning of another journey, one of healing, of reclaiming her identity, and of seeking justice. For the police and the community, it was a moment of reckoning, a realization of the grave errors and oversights that had allowed such an atrocity to remain hidden for nearly a decade. The arrest of Nobuyuki Sato and the rescue of Fusako Sano sent shockwaves through the community and the nation. In the interrogation room, under the harsh glare of the police station lights, 
Nobuyuki Sat, a man whose actions had defied all norms of humanity. The detectives, seasoned by years of encountering criminal minds, found themselves confronting a reality that was difficult to comprehend. Nobuyuki's confession, delivered in a calm, almost detached manner, painted a chilling picture of his psyche. He recounted the day he saw Fuzako, describing her in terms that were disturbingly affectionate. In his twisted perception, he had not kidnapped Fuzako. He had brought her home, a companion to fill the void of his lonely existence. He spoke of caring for her, feeding her, and sharing his interests with her, oblivious to the horror of his actions. Nobuyuki's narrative revealed a deluded sense of reality. He talked about Fuzako as if she were a willing participant in their shared life, a friend who had come to love him as he loved her. His claims were a stark contrast to the truth of Fusako's harrowing experience. A young girl robbed of her freedom, her childhood, and her dignity. He admitted to punishing Fusako for any perceived disobedience, but insisted that these were acts of discipline necessary for their cohabitation. The investigators listened, a mix of revulsion and pity for a mind so lost in its own delusions. Nobuyuki also spoke of his mother, painting her as an intruder in his carefully constructed world. He justified his abusive behavior towards her as necessary to maintain order and control in the house. As the interrogation continued, it became evident that Nobuyuki's mental state was a complex web of delusions, fears, and uncontrolled impulses. Yet, despite his obvious psychological issues, the clarity and detail of his confession indicated a disturbing awareness of his actions. The revelations of this interrogation brought a new understanding of the case, a glimpse into the mind of a man who had lived in the shadows of society, unnoticed and unchallenged, until his world collided with that of Fusako Sano. His confession, while providing answers, also raised profound questions about the nature of evil and the capacity for human cruelty. The trial of Nobuyuki Sato was a focal point of national attention, a judicial proceeding that held more than just the fate of a kidnapper. It was a reckoning for a community and a legal system that had failed to protect one of its most vulnerable members. As the trial commenced, the courtroom became a gallery of mixed emotions, outrage, grief, and a collective yearning for justice. The prosecutors presented a case steeped in the harrowing details of Fusako's captivity and the psychological torment she endured. Evidence of Nobuyuki's meticulously planned abduction and the subsequent years of abuse painted a clear picture of his guilt. Nobuyuki's defense, hinging on his mental state, argued for leniency. They pointed to his history of psychological disorders, suggesting that these impairments diminished his responsibility for his actions. But the prosecution countered, citing medical evaluations that deemed him capable of understanding the gravity and consequences of his actions. The trial also shed light on the role of Nobuyuki's mother. Although she had been unaware of Fusako's presence in the house, her repeated purchase of feminine products raised questions about her possible complicity, or at the very least, her willful ignorance. However, her own victimization at the hands of her son and her attempts to seek help were also brought to the fore, painting a complex picture of her involvement. As the trial progressed, the spotlight turned to the systemic failures that had allowed Nobuyuki to evade detection for so long. The glaring oversight by the police, the missed opportunities to intervene, and the negligence that had left Fusako's disappearance unresolved for nearly a decade came under severe criticism. This led to the resignation of key police officials and a public demand for accountability and reform in the law enforcement system. In May 2000, the verdict was delivered. Nobuyuki Sato was found guilty of kidnapping and several other charges related to Fusako's captivity. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison, the maximum term allowed for his crimes. The sentence, while bringing a sense of closure, also sparked debate about the adequacy of the punishment relative to the severity of his actions. Nobuyuki's release in 2015 and his subsequent death in early 2017 ended his story in this tragic case. However, Fusako Sano's story and the scars left by her ordeal will reverberate long after the hammer falls on this landmark case.
In the aftermath of the trial, Fusako Sano, now liberated from her physical captivity, faced a new journey, one of healing and reclamation of her life. The world she returned to was vastly different from the one she had been snatched away from nearly a decade earlier. She found herself at the center of a narrative she never chose, her name synonymous with one of the most harrowing kidnapping cases in Japanese history. Physically weak and psychologically scared, Fusako embarked on the arduous path to recovery. The once vibrant and cheerful girl had emerged from captivity a shadow of her former self. Her muscles, weakened from years of confinement, struggled to carry her. The sunlight, once a source of warmth and joy, now seemed too harsh, too alien. Her voice, silenced for so long, faltered as she tried to express her thoughts and feelings. Her parents, who had endured years of uncertainty and grief, were faced with the daunting task of helping their daughter rebuild her life. The reunion, though filled with relief and love, was also marked by the pain of seeing the extent of the damage inflicted upon Fusako. They moved away from Mitsuk, seeking a fresh start away from the memories that haunted their old home. Fusako adopted a new name, Sachiko Yamada, as part of her attempt to move forward. She took small, tentative steps towards reclaiming her independence. Photography became a therapeutic outlet for her, a way to express herself without words. She even succeeded in obtaining her driver's license, a significant achievement given her years of confinement. However, the road to recovery was not smooth. In 2007, tragedy struck again when Fusako's father drowned in a family trip. This incident was a cruel blow, a reminder of the fragility of the peace and stability she was striving to achieve. Throughout her journey, Fusako shunned public attention, choosing to heal away from the prying eyes of the media. Her story, a testament to both human cruelty and resilience, continued to resonate with people around the world. But for Fusako, now Sachiko, the focus was on living each day, one step at a time, finding strength in the simple joys that had once defined her childhood. As the years passed, Sachiko's story of survival and resilience served as a beacon of hope to others facing their own battles. Her endurance, her gradual re-emergence into the world, and her relentless pursuit of a normal life stood as a powerful testament to the strength of the human spirit in the face of unimaginable adversity.